Okay, hi, so last, uh, welcome to uh, week two. So we are into week two of our teaching series on hurry, um, rest, spiritual intimacy, the elimination of hurry. And what we're looking at today is the idea of hurry being uh, the cause of sin and hurry being the cause of anxiety. So uh, last week, uh, what we started looking at was the fact that God is never in a hurry. Um, he seems to never be rushed. He takes his time. Uh, and he wants us to take our time as well. Uh, this is largely because he is love. And love is inherently unhurried. And yet we seem so hurried all the time. We rush from place to place, not finding time to give to God. Not finding time to pray. Not having enough time to properly rest in his presence. Um, this week I want to have a look at how throughout the Bible... This hurry has been a, a cause of two major problems. The, the first problem is, is that of sin. Uh, hurry has been a cause of sin throughout Scripture. Um, the second is uh, the, the sort of anxiety, the background anxiety that sits at the back of our minds and leaves us feeling unsafe, insecure a lot of the time. Now, um, some people you might be thinking, I'm not anxious. I don't suffer with anxiety, and that's fantastic, but just to um, give a definition to that word for the sake of uh, what we're talking about today, I'm just going to def define anxiety as how I'm using it from a Christian worldview as being anxiety is the feeling when you imagine the future without God in it. Um, you live like God is not there, or you live like he doesn't exist. Um, that's the place of anxiety, and that's the place of worry. When you live like God is there, when you live like he exists, there will be no need for anxiety or worry. Um, but before we, we come to, to that, let's just look at how through scripture, hurry is the cause uh, of sin. It, it, it's also the cause of sin for us, but it's, it's been the cause of sin for people throughout the scriptures. And we can go all the way back, all the way back to the garden in Genesis 3. Um, this this story of uh, Adam and Eve that comes through and um, God has planted this garden and he's put Adam in it and they've tried to find a helper but there's no helper so they may so God creates Eve and there's this wonderful moment at the start of um, chapter 3 uh, I say wonderful it's actually it's tragic but it, it, it's uh, beautifully written and it says this uh, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made and he said to the woman did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now the woman said to the serpent, "We may eat from, uh, we may eat from the trees in the garden." But God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it, or you will die. You won't die, the serpent said to the woman. God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good. And evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate of it. Now what I love about these uh, opening stories in Genesis is how much they speak to the human condition, how much they talk about what it is to be human. And there is so much that can resonate with this, this situation, this situation he finds herself in where she's in a situation things are going well she's got this garden to enjoy she's got this whole world around her she's got um she's got adam there they've got jobs to do they've got things to do in in, in the work they have for, for the lord and yet the snake comes along and the snake um, offers her something instantly it says right now you can have this it's right there available to you you can have it now now, there is an awful lot of wisdom in these stories. There's an awful lot about the human condition in these opening, um, these opening few uh, chapters of Genesis. But I'm just going to focus in on the timings involved here. You see, God was walking with them. God walked with Adam and Eve. Later, just after this, God shows up again, wanting to walk with them. See, God was nurturing them. God was commissioning them. He'd given them jobs to do. He was alongside them. This would have brought them into something over time. They would have grown. 
But the, certain, the serpent comes along and says, just eat the fruit. Just have it now. Have it quickly. Get it. And if Eve had just slowed down, maybe if she just said, before I act on this temptation, before I act on it, I'm just going to give it some time and I'm going to speak to God about this first. You've asked me, did God say it? I'm just going to go and ask him. I'm just going to talk to him. I talk to him every day. I'm just going to talk to him. If she'd spoken to God about it, if she'd seen what he had to say, she may have avoided the entire issue. But she didn't. She looked. She saw that it was good. And she ate it. And in doing so, she fell into sin, sin and shame. She was offered instant, and her rush to get it led to sin. Her hurry led to sin. So let's fast forward a few chapters. Oh, no, sorry, fast forward one chapter to chapter four, and we get to the story of Cain and Abel. Um, Cain and Abel are Adam and Eve's um, uh, sons, and in this case, just so you're aware, following the story, there are literally four people on the planet right now. Um, and it says this, that Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. It says, in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil and offered it to the Lord. Abel also bought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of the flock. The Lord looked with favour on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not look with favour. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. And then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked and killed his brother Abel. So you see, what happens here is Cain gets angry about what has happened in terms of these offerings. That he, that he and his brother have brought to God. Now God does speak to him about it. And look at what he says. What God says. He says, if you do what is right, it will be accepted. Otherwise, sin is crouching at your door. Rule over it. You know, learning to rule over emotions is a slow process that we learn in partnership with God. I'm still learning how to rule anger, how to deal with it well, how to rule over it. But Cain doesn't want to take the time to do that. Cain doesn't want to walk with God and learn how to rule his anger. He doesn't want to learn how to do the acceptable right thing. He wants the issue fixed now. He's angry. He's angry with Abel. He doesn't point it back at himself. He doesn't actually let God speak to him. God has said it, but Abel hasn't received it. He wants the issue fixed now. He wants this emotion dealt with, so he's going to deal with it now. So he goes out and he kills his brother. He was in a rush to get this emotional need fixed. That led him to sin. If we then fast forward to chapter 11 in the Tower of Babel, another uh, fantastic story about the nature of man. Now, going back right to the very start of Genesis, uh, God had actually given the commission to go into all the earth and fill it. Now, the people in Babel had decided, we're not going to carry on filling. We're going to congregate. We're going to build a city. They, and they decided that they, you know, they wanted to be like God. They wanted to reach the heavens. So what they do is they take it out of God's hands. They take it into their own timing. They rush to build this, this tower and in doing so, they sin. Now there are, there are many more examples throughout Genesis. Um, but I just want to focus on a couple of examples later on as well, just in case you're not convinced that hurry, that rashness, that, that, that sort of impulsive uh, behaviour actually does cause us to, to fall into sin. Um, we could look at um, a, a story of King Saul in chapter 13 of 1 Samuel. Um, just for context, um, Saul is king and he's about to lead his people into battle against the Philistines. But he wants to offer a sacrifice first and he needs Samuel, who is a priest, to do so. Uh, so starting in um, verse 7, this is chapter 13, it says this. It said, Saul remained a Gilgal and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. 
So he said, well, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he had finished making the offering, Samuel arrived and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? asked Samuel. Saul replied, when I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the same time, the Philistines were assembling at Michmash. I thought, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal. I have not sought the Lord's favour, so I com felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. Saul was not prepared to wait to do it right. Now, when you say that, like he waited seven days, but just think about this. He said, Samuel's not here. I'm worried. People are, my, my, my troops are leaving. He puts a heavy, he puts a nice slant on it that he wanted the Lord's favour, but his troops were running away. He wanted to, to do everything that appeared right. He wanted to uh, offer, the, offer the sacrifice so they could go into battle because he wanted the battle. He wanted to get involved. When you say he waited seven days, he then says, bring the burnt and the fellowship offering. And as he finished the offering, Samuel arrived. I mean, we're talking hours maybe. But in rushing to do this, in taking it out of the way God wanted done and into his own agenda, into his own timing, he fell into sin. He had his timing, he had his agenda, he, wa he knew what he wanted to achieve. He rushed the sacrifice rather than waiting correctly for Samuel. And we find another example, if, if this isn't enough, if we find another example of hurry and rush leading to sin... In 2 Samuel chapter 11, this is the story of David and Bathsheba. Um, it says this, One evening David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, She is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to her. To, sorry, they sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanliness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. How fast does that go? David says, you know, it, feels, it seems like he can't sleep. Um, he's lying there awake in the middle of the night. He can't sleep. He gets up. He goes to his roof for a walk. He sees a beautiful woman. He wants her, he gets her, he sleeps with her and she's pregnant before the chapters, before the paragraph's finished. If at some point in that process he had stopped and prayed, saw God on it, or even if his rhythm of life had had a regular time in prayer, time to hear God and reconnect with the source, time to check himself and let God speak into his weakness, that would have been avoided. But he wanted it instant. He wanted it now. He was rushed. He wanted what he saw and he wanted it now. You know, God offers a remedy for the human condition of the obsession of instant and now. He offers us a way of living, a practice in his kingdom that deals with this. And this is called rest. It is found in a quiet time. It's found in the quiet place. It's found in the place that is set aside for communion with the Father. It's not stopping. It's not inactivity. It's not doing our hobbies. It is rest in the Father. You see, whenever God speaks of being with him, he, he talks in slow terms. He wants us to slow down and be with him. Very famous passage, very famous line, one which is said very uh, freely, is be still and know that I am God. You know, the, the, the original language here really means stop striving in all your own strength. Stop trying to make it happen yourself. Stop trying to um, create what you want to occur. Be still. Stop that. And in doing so, you will see what I am. And you will see that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. In Proverbs 21, it says, The plans of the diligent 
leads surely to abundance. You know, diligence is a slow process. It's a, it's a long-term process. It says the plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. Or in, uh, in, in 1 Peter 3, it says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, as some count slowness, but he is patient towards you. See, sometimes people think God acts slowly. He doesn't act slow. Well, he acts slowly, but not in the way that people think of the word slowly. What he is, is he's patient. He's just taking his time. You know, when we look, at, when we look into the life of Jesus, it is steeped in alone time with the Father. Mark 1 says this, says this, Rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. This was just part of Jesus' rhythm. If David had that in his rhythm, it wouldn't have happened with Bathsheba. He rose early in the morning. He went to a quiet, lonely, desolate, empty place. And he prayed. And in doing so, he connected himself to the Father. You know, in fact, I could, I could only really find one time that Jesus directly instructs somebody to act fast. To actually hurry. And it's a really interesting one because it is when he says to Judas Iscariot at the Last Supper, knowing he was about to betray him, knowing that Judas was about to head into sin, he says this, whatever you are about to do, do it quickly. See, Jesus even knows that sin has to be done quickly. Because if we, are, if we give time to God, we can avoid it. I mean, it, so all of this is in the, in the Bible and that, that, that's great, that, that's interesting, but is it still true? Is Hubby still causing us to act when he has better ways for us? Um, I can't help but say yes. I, I know it's true of me. Uh, the quick response is often the unkindest one. Um, the word said in frustration is the most damaging one. The desire to get it my way now leads to me to want to get it in ways that are not honouring of the king or his kingdom. And it's not just at the personal level, it's, it's through our society, you know, fast fashion. I see it on a model one day, I want it in the shops the next day. Fast fashion, getting that new piece of clothing, that is a major cause of climate change and child exploitation in the world. That t-shirt that we, we buy one day and we wear the next. Actually, somebody has probably not been paid well, somebody has not been honoured well in the midst of that. You know, the stock market, there's billions of transactions every single second. This, this accumulation, rapid, 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 has led to immense um, wealth gaps between the rich and the poor. You know, social media, and we, in social media, we can fall into the sort of instant um, and rapid sort of view, feel, respond culture. I see it, I have an emotion, I'm hitting back. And it leads to all sorts of unpleasantness. As leads to unpleasantness between believers who are battling out over some sort of wall, and nobody's actually, everyone's just shouting into, into the void of the internet, and no one's listening anymore because all they want is to respond just quickly. But maybe there is a better way. Maybe there's a better way than this. Maybe there's a way that the world is crying out for that the people of God need to start modeling. But we'll come back to that because the issue is hurry rush doing it in our timing it has it has another effect on our souls when we spend our lives hurried fixing things ourselves moving fast to get it done it raises us in us a sort of um, pseudo christianity um, a faith without a god if we're not careful we can end up Going through the motions of Christianity, we sing our songs on a Sunday, we attend meetings, we eat at tables, and yet we live our lives as if God isn't actually there. So we have the motions, we have the faith, we have the sort of religion, but our lives don't actually act like God's in them. We know our Bibles, yet we don't actually know the God that the scriptures are leading us to. 
you know, we can identify this in ourselves. We can ask ourselves the question to find out, is this the way I live my life by asking this? When trouble hits, are we people who slow down, go to God in total trust, pray it through, take our time and give him time? Or do we panic, stress, worry and live with a background anxiety as if God is not actually there? When I, um, when I was at Bible college and we lived in Swansea, I had a friend in the church. And when I first met him, um, he was definitely someone who lived the pattern of Christianity uh, and yet was a seriously unpleasant person to spend any time with. Uh, he was angry, he was always rushed, always hurried, always busy, um, lacked faith, really lacked faith. And then something happened where he actually really met Jesus, um, changed him. And about a year after this, I was uh, in a car with him and he said something that really stayed with me. Um, a problem had come up in his life and he had chosen to do nothing about it. And I asked him why, and he said this, he said, I have learnt that when a problem comes up, if I give God a week, he probably doesn't need me. You know, he had gained a knowledge of the slowed down nature of God and had faith that God was perfectly capable of fixing any problem without him. He had learned to live a life lacking in anxiety. And you know his whole character changed with it. He became increasingly patient with people, increasingly loving, increasingly kind. See, in learning to slow down, in learning to um, give God time, to not rush, to trust God, to rest in God, he had opened up the way for God to grow him into who God had made him to be. He had gained testimonies. You see, when we try to fix everything ourselves, we never learn how good God is at not needing us to. You know, a, an example from my own life is that over the last um, year, yeah, just over a year, me and Steph have been putting aside a day a week to rest. It sounds very religious when you say that, and we're going to be teaching on it in a few weeks' time, but we've given aside a day a week to just rest. Spend time with one another, spend time with God. We turn our phones off, we disconnect, we do things that restore us. And when we first looked at this, we thought, how are we going to do everything we need to do if we take a day and don't do it? But we did it. And it's changed us. I don't feel the frantic, anxious person I once was. I don't feel the sense of, Oh, you know what, I've got, I've got to take on another job because if, if I don't take it on, it's not going to get done. I've learned that actually, you know what, there's two, there's two lies in that. The first is that it needs to be done. And the second is that God would be my, in my debt over time. We give God time and we don't lose anything from it. We only gain increasing knowledge of him and increasing freedom in him. So just to conclude, hurry, rush, these things lead to sin. They lead us to sin. They lead us to not live as God would want us to live. On top of that, they lead us to an existence that has an ongoing background anxiety. This almost, it has become normal to be worried and uneasy all the time. A life that actually doesn't believe God's going to be there, even though we might never say that. And that in itself is surely enough of a reason for any follower of Jesus to say something needs to change. But as they say, nothing changes unless something changes. But the good news is that there is a solution. There is a practice from the way of Jesus that is the solution. And that solution is to intentionally slow down and give space to God. To enter into his rest without agenda. 
to go into prayer without a list of things to pray for and just sit in his presence. To find ourselves intentionally in his presence. To put, a time, to put time aside for him to speak to us, to grow us and to challenge us. But this takes such intentionality. And it won't change tomorrow. In learning how to rest, it's taken me and Steph probably over a year and we're still learning it. But it is changing us. But it won't change tomorrow. This is not the sort of thing you can try once and if it doesn't work, it hasn't worked. See, to learn the lesson of living unhurried and living in rest, by very definition, takes a long time of doing it. It's, there is no instant fix to the problem of desiring an instant fix. There is only the discipline to move away from that way of living. And so I'd like to offer a challenge. This week, I want you to try to find something that in the normal course of your pattern of life, you would want to deal with immediately. And I want you to try doing it. 24 hours and prayer before you deal with it this is going to be really really hard because when you see things the immediate thing is right back like the serpent said in in, in the garden fix it now get it now but that is the deception now of course just to be clear about this i am not talking about like if you see a car crash or something you know that requires some immediacy of action that requires you to act you're not going to do that and then say oh, I'll give that 24 hours like Ben said you don't want to do that right but it might be they see a Facebook post that angers you and your immediate response is I'm going to respond to that I'm going to challenge you give it a day give it a day pray it through see if your response changes or it might be you receive a, a text message from somebody that you just think oh, I'm not happy about that and you, you, you can feel your thumb about to write back and I just want to challenge you, give it a day and pray about it. See if your response changes. Or maybe some level of anxiety creeps in, something enters your head and it just sits on you and you don't know what to do with it and you want to just deal with it now. I want to pray. I want to challenge you to just give it a day and pray about it. Give it to God. Enter his rest in the midst of the problem. Just to finish, I'm going to finish with the passage from last week, the, the, from the message translation, it says this. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly.